Let's start with Keir Starmer. We've talked a lot about Israel and Gaza this morning. Keir Starmer, uh, he, he claims that, uh, insists that Labour is united over Gaza. Now, this is after Ed Balls has warned the rebellion hit party was at risk of decay unless he restores discipline. Now, the Labour leader says there isn't a great division, and yet at the same time we see these two leaders of Labour councils saying they're calling for Keir Starmer to resign because he's not calling for a ceasefire uh, in Gaza. Do, do, do you think um, Keir Starmer will toe the line and stay, and stay firm where he says there is no ceasefire, but we need humanitarian pause or aid in? Keir Starmer will hold the line. The Labour Party will hold mm. the line. And I think the simple test is, who has resigned? Has any has any shadow minister resigned? Has any backbencher in any position as a ministerial aide resigned? What we have are some noises off from some, not even council leaders, in some cases leaders of groups where most of the group actually disagree with them. I think the internal politics of those two areas has probably more to say about what these these individuals have said so and also just on what Ed Balls said yeah Ed Balls is one of the people yeah he's, he's a national treasure now but at the end of the 2000s the end of the last Labour government I was just thinking is he <laughs> well he is he's, he's been on Strictly and he, right. and he, and he bakes and does that make you a national treasure <laughs> I, I, I think we'll have to refer that to the commission <laughs> okay, very good, very good. His, his political advice at the end of the Brown government and his sniping and briefing is one of the reasons the Brown government fell I'd be yeah, well, despite his, his recent rehabilitation, I'd just take what Ed Ball says with a pinch of salt. OK, Lettuce, where do you stand on this? I mean, yeah. Keir Starmer is, 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 has a delicate balance here, but I think yeah. it, for, if he is going to be Prime Minister, he has to show uh, resolve, he has to stay firm, and he has to stick to his position, doesn't he? Well, yeah, exactly, and I do agree that he is going to stick to this position. One of the biggest criticisms of Sir Keir over the past few years has been this sort of unable to make a decision flip-flopping, unable to decide on anything, and I think you will. One of the things I think is so important when looking at this, though, is the sort of rhetoric and language that we're using and the term ceasefire that people are calling for. Mm. What does that actually mean? Because it means that both Israel and Hamas would have to put down their weapons, and frankly, I don't believe that Hamas would be willing to do that. They are a terrorist does. organization. Mm. But it's also calling for a pause in humanitarian aid, which again, Israel is not willing to do right now, as we saw yesterday, because they fear that it will allow them, uh, Hamas, to either move the hostages or to regroup during this sort of pause mm. that goes on. Mm. Right. I actually think Hamas may well be prepared to put down their weapons at the moment for a very short period of time, just to reorganise themselves, regroup. take a breather and regroup, and I think that's the fear. Do you, do, you, do you think that actually Hamas has been caught off guard by the strength of the mm -hmm. Israeli no, uh, response? No, no, I don't think at any point they could have imagined a different response that mm. would come. I don't think many people could have sort of imagined a different response from the violence that we saw on the 7th of October. I think where Hamas have, has been caught off guard, they didn't expect their attack to wreak the havoc it did. Well, that's really mm. what I meant by that. Um, because I think their original plan, and you sort of look at sort of some of the Arab um, news channels, their original plan seems to have been get some hostages, bargain for a release of some of their of some Hamas prisoners, mm. claim some form of victory, quite a localised thing. They'd be hit a bit, but they did mm. not think that this would happen. And I thought, when you see what the leader of Hezbollah said yesterday, which is basically, um, OK, well done, Hamas, we knew nothing about it and we know nothing <laughs> about what you're going to do and please don't uh, bomb uh, well, us. Well, it wasn't yeah. us, yeah. is what he uh, said, uh, yeah. And when you... Uh, that is... That's an, a group that is worried about being hit. This has gone much bigger, much faster than they originally thought. And, and how much of that is actually down to... Um, I, I think Israel was about to do something far bigger in terms of a response. I think the US played a very important role, probably the UK as well, in terms of saying the response now needs to be measured and thought through in terms of the way that well, you proceed. I, I think with Israel, there are two, two failures, strategic military failures. There's the military failure to see what was coming, but there's also a military failure to have a plan to pick up off the shelf to then right, to hit immediately. One of the things about you know, Israel is there's that phrase, change the facts on the ground. The pause, the fact they didn't have a plan meant they didn't go in quickly enough uh, in a way which was proportionate and it has, you know, has to be, but they didn't respond quickly enough and mm. the world is now inflamed 
and their task in terms of, and it is a justified task to stop what's happened happened on October 7th happening again that task is so much more difficult and that, that's what the mm. side of the Israeli military failure I think that in when we, in coming years will be reviewed a lot more just, just in terms of um, Keir Starmer and if he does stand firm there's a, the front page I think of the Times this morning Talking about the problems within Keir Starmer, so I think mm. your point is valid, though, how many have actually resigned. But we talk about the front bench, back bench, rebellion, what's going on. Um, can, can Keir Starmer afford to lose those Muslim seats? So he has many seats mm. in, in this country that are predominantly Muslim voters, or indeed the Muslim voters make up a high percentage of those people who vote. Can if he does that, there is a sense that he may alienate some of the Muslim voters. Can he afford yeah. to do that? Should he do that? I mean, should he stick to his principles? I think that ultimately, if you just look at this statistically, considering how far ahead they are in the polls, he probably could take that hit. But if he is any politician, you know, worth his merit, he will work to earn back those votes. The fear right now within the Labour Party is that we're going to see a sort of repeat of something that happened in 2005 where the Labour Party lost a lot of Muslim voters because of the war in Iraq that exactly. was going on. And it's a fear that that will be repeated. But ultimately, if you just statistically look at it, I think he could take this hit and they would still win at the next general election. Well, according to the article in the Times, the party mm. stance compounded by the errors that they put into this have, could put seats with majorities of up to 15,000 in Muslim areas at risk. But surely this shouldn't, I mean, it, when it comes to a general election, is it going to be a single issue? I don't think no, so. Under, no, it, this, this, is just, this is just an attempt to flam up a story. I was a press office for the Labour Party in the 90s and I remember so clearly in the run up to the in the uh, run up to the 97 election this was kind of early 96 normally the party would create a manifesto for minorities a manifesto for young people and Alistair Campbell came to a meeting and said no we're not doing any of that and he's and there was like shock because this is what the party had already, always done and he said uh, whether you're a minority or a young person, you have the same desires as the rest of the country. Yeah. You want to pay. You want a better. You want better pay. You want law and order. You want a working health service. And right, you, uh, you want to be able to pay your mortgage. These are the issues which will determine the next election. And it doesn't matter whether you're Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Christian. That is what will determine the election. And that's why this is a classic SW1 Westminster mm. sort of type of story. Well, it, it is, it is, although we mustn't forget that Luciana Berger, um, in leaving the Labour Party, did do a lot of damage there and really brought the anti-Semitism argument to a head. And lots of her voters, and I live in that area, deserted her when she was part of the Labour Party because of that and went to the Lib Dems when she joined them. Mm -hmm. So some people do vote with their feet over one issue. But I think the, the, the crisis on, with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party was of a different different order to this and it was a different order because that part that you know the ECHR the the, the, the the ECHRC was really clear we you know we in the Labour Party had a problem it was a problem that compounded and grew and grew over years and I think there were two aspects to it one the, the Jewish community turned away understandably uh, and number two uh, it pointed it was a marker for a broader extremism under Jeremy Corbyn and one of Keir Starmer's achievements is to win back the trust in to some extent it's a work in progress of the Jewish community and show the Labour Party isn't an extremist party anymore. But you also have noises off. So you've got people like George Galloway, who won Bradford West in 2012. He sent an email now to Labour councillors criticising Starmer's support for Zionism. So people are stirring the pot, whether you like it or not. But also, just in terms of Tower Hamlets, where uh, I uh, have a flat in London, Tower Hamlets, remember Luther Rahman removed from Tower Hamlets. Again, the Muslim vote, very, very important in, in mm. Tower Hamlets. And I think, and, and I, this is where I do think Ed Balls is right, Unless Starmer has discipline over his party, it could actually be partly his undoing. Look, where, wherever you see it's sort of one side being like, he will lose votes here, there will be another side that's supporting what he's doing. And a lot of maybe those Conservative seats, those Labour seats that went blue back in 2019, might be seeing his stance on Israel and his position that he's taking right now as a reason to go back to Labour mm. and support him. Mm. So although he might be losing votes here, he could be gaining them back. He, those, he could well be. I just can't help feeling, though, that although he has done a good job of, of shoring up the Labour Party, Party and the anti-Semitism face, he has actually just put a sticking plaster over it. And what we're it's seeing still there, now, isn't it? what we're seeing now because of this, are the edges of that plaster peeling away, the, and, and and ooze is seeping out. The, um, 
Mm. Anti-Semitism, very graphic. Anti anti-Semitism is, is always there. It's the oldest hatred, and it, it, it is there throughout, not throughout all parties. I think the point about Keir Starmer and what he's done is recognise this is a problem and face it head on. And people have been expelled. And, you know, we are seeing in the Labour Party, and I speak as a centrist member of the Labour Party of kind of nearly sort of 40 years, that we're, you know, we're seeing that the Corbyn, some of those anti-Semitic Corbynites, they're self-purging. They're going off, they're forming yeah. new parties. The Labour Party is renewing, just like we renewed in the 90s after the, the dark years under, uh, or the dark, the dark <laughs> under Michael Foote and the catastrophe of 1983.